In this video, we're going to be looking at topic 8GE, which is Pure Metals and Alloys. And this is part of the Year 8 Exploring Science course for Key Stage 3. So our learning objective for today is to answer the question, what makes alloys so useful? So by the end, hopefully you will be able to explain what alloys are and why they are used. You should be able to use models to explain the properties of alloys and identify a pure or an impure substance using the melting and boiling point. So this is the fifth and final section of topic 8G for metals, focusing on pure metals, alloys, and then the properties of these. So to recap the previous lesson, we were looking at how metals react with acid, and we said that the metals will react faster than they do with water, and we can still use these difference in reactivities to form the reactivity series, because the pattern is the same no matter if you're reacting the metal with acid, water or oxygen. When you react it with an acid, you're going to form hydrogen gas and you also form a salt solution. And if we want to get the solid salt, what we do is we evaporate the water from the solution. We also looked at the different types of salts that we can get. So we had sulfuric acid making sulfate salts, nitric acid making nitrate salts, and hydrochloric acid making chloride salts. And we looked at the word equations for those as well. And the reactivity series that we build from these reactions can be used to predict the position of another metal, or we can use it to predict the reactions if we know where the metal is in the reactivity series. Now, when we're looking at the metals that we use in everyday life, the majority of metals that you come across are actually not the pure metal, i.e. they're not just made of one metal element, for example, gold or copper or iron. The majority of the metals that we use in our everyday life actually have other metals also mixed in, and these mixtures are known as alloys. So alloys is when we have a mixture of different metals. Now, sometimes we can add in some non-metals, but they tend to be mixtures of metals being joined together. Now remember, a mixture means that they are not chemically joined. So these metals are not bonded together, they are not chemically joined together like you would get in something like magnesium oxide, but they are mixed in of the atoms and with the other metal elements. And we'll look at how we draw this out in just a minute. Now alloys are very useful because they have more desirable properties than pure metals. So what we do is we take a property of a metal, we form a, an alloy from that metal to enhance that property. For example, to make it stronger or to have a higher boiling point or melting point or a lower melting point. And these properties are enhanced or made more desirable because they are then very useful when we want to use them for things like building materials or forming everyday objects um, and lots of other different uses. And we're going to look at some examples. So here are three examples of alloys. So we have solder, which has the main metal of lead with some tin being added in. And this gives the alloy a lower melting point and what we use this for is actually to bond metals together. So solder is used in things like computer microchips or motherboards and electronics in order to bind these metals together. We can also have duralumin, which is um, aluminium as its main metal with copper and magnesium also being added in. And this causes it to be a much lighter metal, but it also increases the strength. And we use this for airplane bodies, because obviously in order for the plane to get off the ground, we want to make sure it is light enough, um, but we have to make sure it is strong so that it can withstand the different temperatures and of course the air pressure as well. Then we have stainless steel. Now this is probably an alloy that you've come into contact with every single day and you maybe just didn't know it. So stainless steel uses iron as its main metal and then we add in some carbon 
to make the steel, but we can also add in some chromium or some nickel and sometimes there's some other metals as well. Now, not only does this make the metal stronger, it makes it more resistant to corrosion. So we talked about iron when it is rusted and we said that when iron rusts, it becomes brittle, meaning it can be easily broken. When we use stainless steel, we're adding these extra elements in order to make it stronger so that it's not brittle anymore and it stops it from corroding. And we use stainless steel for things like cutlery, our knives or forks or spoons. We can also use it for sinks and also for jewellery. You may hear of stainless steel watches or stainless steel necklaces, things like that. And again, it's because they are always put in the elements and we want to keep them um, from corroding. So here's some composition of different alloys. Now you're going to do some research on alloys um, and you can go away and you can look up lots of different alloys and what's the different elements that are in them and what properties they have, but this is just some of them. So we have amalgam used in dental fillings, brass, bronze, um, pewter, nitinol, nichrome, steel, white gold, and you'll have probably heard of most of these metals before and wondered why is something like bronze not on the periodic table. So you'll have heard of a bronze medal in the Olympics, but bronze is not an element, so it's not on the periodic table, it's actually an alloy. So you might want to go away and do some research and figure out what other alloys you may have heard of and alloys that you come across in your everyday life. The difference in the properties of alloys compared to pure metals can be compared by looking at the structure and how they're put together. So when we have different sized atoms being added into a metal, it changes this regular lattice structure. So metals have our atoms all in a row and columns nice regularly arranged in this lattice structure. But as soon as you start to put a different atom in, it's going to throw that off balance. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. And when we get this change, it means that the layers in the lattice can no longer easily slide over each other. And it's this sliding that makes the metal brittle. So let's look at what this actually looks like. So if we have a pure metal, we have a structure that might look something like this. So you can see I'm making all of the atoms roughly the same size, because of course they are all of the same element, and they are all in this regular lattice structure, meaning they're held in this nice pattern. And what happens is if we put a force like a hammer or something into the, the metal, we can have these layers of atoms sliding. So we may end up with something where we have the top layer staying the same, sorry, the bottom two layers staying the same, and then the top layer moving like that because we've applied a force. So we're getting the layers sliding over each other and this can work in our, our advantage because that can make them malleable but it also makes the metal brittle. Now when we have an alloy we're adding in different metals so these different metals are going to have different size atoms so rather than having this regular lattice you get something that's potentially like this. So you can see now that we're getting a difference in the size of the lattice. So you can see that we're getting this moving a little bit over. So now these layers can easily slide over each other. So if we put in a force, the layers don't slide and because that they don't slide that makes the alloy much stronger okay so if we have the pure metal the layers can slide over each other meaning the metal can be broken when we have an alloy the layers can't do this so it actually makes it stronger 
And this is a slightly better diagram that we've taken from the textbook. So we've got our metal atoms arranged in layers. We have our large force moving the particles, whereas in an alloy, these larger black particles are going to stop the, the blue layers of atoms from moving so that they can't slide as easily, making it stronger. Now, one of the most commonly changed properties in alloys, as well as strength, is also the melting point when we compare it to a pure metal. So a pure metal it will have a boiling point or a melting point of one specific temperature. For example, it may melt at, let's say, 350 degrees Celsius or 450, something that is very specific. When we have an alloy or any mixture, these are impure substances because they are made of lots of different things. These are going to melt or boil over a range of temperatures. So they will melt from, let's say, 325 degrees up to 370 degrees. So rather than it being just this one particular melting point, they can melt over a range and the temperature ranges are going to depend on the percentages of each metal in the alloy. So for example, if we have um, an alloy for pure made of tin and lead and we compare this to the melting points, so for pure lead it's 327 as we can see from here and if we have pure tin it's 232, as we can see from here. Now, when we mix the two of these, we're actually then bringing this melting point lower down. And what you can see is that this part is now wider. So because it is now wider on the graph, that means that this is a range of temperatures, as opposed to the very small narrow part that you can see at either side, meaning that it is one specific temperature. So we have this range of temperatures because we're getting these different metals. Now making an alloy can not only change its physical properties, it can also change the chemical properties. And the most common example, one we've mentioned, is the formation of stainless steel. And this is by adding carbon into iron and it only takes very small amounts of carbon in order for this to happen. But as soon as we then form this stainless steel alloy, it is then less reactive. So that would mean it would be lower on the reactivity series. And we know that the reactivity series, the most reactive are at the top and the least reactive are at the bottom. So if it's lower, it means it's going to be less easily corroded because it does not react with the oxygen that is in our atmosphere. So an example of using stainless steel instead of pure iron is the Chrysler building in New York City. So despite this being built back in 1930, quite a number of years ago, it is still shiny on the outside. And you can see in the picture, it is in a bright day that the outside is this bright, shiny color, particularly at the top here. And this is because it's made of stainless steel, so it has not corroded. There is no rust forming on the iron because we've formed an alloy instead. And this is completely different to the Statue of Liberty. Remember we previously discussed the Statue of Liberty is made of copper, pure copper, and it was oxidized because it was reacting with the oxygen forming that green colour on top, whereas the stainless steel Chrysler building is resistant to corrosion, so it does not get oxidised, keeping its shine. So we should have now answered the question, what makes alloys so useful? Hopefully now you can explain what alloys are and why they are used. You can draw a model to explain the properties of alloys, so looking at how the particles are arranged, and how we can identify pure or impure substances by their melting or boiling points. If there's anything that you're not sure about, please feel free to leave a comment below or ask your teacher, and we hope to see you back soon.